of everybody getting sick. So he said he'd study the problem, and he uh, said, I won't need time for this. The Navy didn't say anything at first. Then they indicated to him, along about the 1st of August, says, you have until the 12th of August to finish these tests or forget it, which uh, in engineering parlance is a drop-dead test date. No one could understand why the Navy was dictating a drop-dead test date. How much time was it? You said 12th of August, right? Yeah, this and about 12 went, more days. Oh, in 12 days, so it was like... So everybody worked around the clock. Wow. Yeah. And uh, they did so, yes, we uh, don't want optical invisibility, only radar invisibility. If you can uh, change that so we only have radar invisibility and not optical invisibility, we would prefer this because in those days you had no lower insurance or all the navigational systems we have today. It's questionable whether they would have worked on those conditions too, but in any, <clears throat> any case, we don't want the ships to be invisible because at night in a convoy we could have one ship ramming another. Yeah, but you were so far along, I mean, this this system was designed to give you invisibility. Right. And how could you in 12 days have any chance of changing any of the engineering around so that all you could do is have optical or radar invisibility? I know I've said it was no problem to do this. Uh, you just backtrack slightly on how far you carry this in terms of the phase differential field in relation to the main field. And he apparently was successful in doing that as subsequent results showed. Okay, yeah, so about, uh, about the 9th of August, everybody started to get a queasy feeling in the pit of their stomach that something was very, very wrong. Nobody had any idea what. But many people, virtually, not in the entire crew, but virtually the entire crew, felt very uneasy. Uh, as I recall, Von Neumann didn't. The other officers didn't, but I did, and Duncan did. I didn't, it would only be another three days before we found out there was really something radically wrong. But it was not with our equipment. Comes the 12th of August, of course. We go again back down over the first test site, very close to it. And then we have, for this test, three ships for observers, a carrier, a Coast Guard ship, name unknown, and a uh, commercial ship. <clears throat> one of the uh, merchant ships, the USS Ferguseth, and of course the various observing people on board them. In terms of uh, the carrier, of course, we had Von Neumann, we had Captain Harris, and we had some other staff people in the Institute, as well as in the Navy Yard. Okay, now what we'll do is uh, drop it here and then we'll pick it up right at uh, the start of the second test. The Philadelphia Experiment. Al, this subject is perhaps what you are best known for. You played a critical role in that experiment. Now, in previous programs, you described all the work and tests leading up to that famous test on August the 13th, 1943, where the USS Eldridge became invisible. Now, let's start this program with you taking us back to that fateful morning in 1943, just before the start of the test. Okay. By the time the 12th of August rolled around, <clears throat> we'd all more or less gotten used to that queasy feeling and figured, well, this is it today, or whatever happens, happens. And we became somewhat resigned to it, though we still didn't understand why we were basically uneasy. <clears throat> So on that morning, the test crew marched aboard the ship. Duncan and I were there, and the, not immediately and down in the hold where we ran all the equipment, but we were on board. The captain of the ship was there, and of course, for that particular occasion, they had three test ships. They had, I should say, three observer ships. And there were three test ships, too, for that matter, but we're not getting into that in this moment. Uh, Dr. Von Neumann, uh, Captain Harris, and all the others on the deck with the carrier. There was a Coast Guard cutter, which was an observing ship, and the USS Furioseth, which was a standard commercial uh, 
ship for hauling cargo across the Atlantic or wherever. Were there any medical ships around? No medical ships around per se, no. There were some medical people on board the carrier, I'm sure, but there was no specific need felt for a medical ship as such. If anything went wrong, there weren't going to be, there wasn't going to be much they could do out there in the uh, middle of the bay anyway. They're going to have to get the ship back or unload the personnel if they had to and uh, take them ashore and into the yard and uh, or end any of the uh, naval facility hospitals. So all of those ships were just sitting out there for observation exactly. purposes, right? <laughs> now one of the interesting points about this, which I had almost forgotten about, but is perhaps important, there was a sudden change of plans on the morning of the 12th of August. Captain Harrison, in the process of observing the first test on the 22nd of July, as I have mentioned, noticed a very large water line, much larger than the ship. A water line meaning this is where the water apparently stopped, and then you had a vacuum, so to speak, a space there you couldn't understand. And, of course, there was no ship in there, but the hole in the outline of a ship was much larger than the ship itself. And he could not see, looking through his binoculars on the deck of the, uh, of the carrier, he could not see where the water was down at the bottom, if, uh, so to speak. There should have been a bottom level where he could see the water. Well, he couldn't. Did it look like a black hole or something? It looked very much like a black hole. Hmm. Now, he was concerned that he wasn't sure whether that ship was actually riding in water that he couldn't see or whether it was floating in air. So he had planned for a series of special tests on the 12th of August, which included uh, special seismometers, special measuring devices on board the Eldridge, including a special secondary crew just to run those pieces of equipment, and a submarine which was scheduled to go around the hole, if you will, and see, is it really a hole or what's going on here? Now, uh, for whatever reason, at the last minute, <coughs> They canceled all of those extra tests. The submarine was not scheduled in to be part of it, and the secondary crew was not put on board the ship. The equipment was already there, but they didn't use it or do anything with it. And all of the regular personnel got on board the ship. It went down river to a point where it was stationed for the test, and then by command on the radio came the orders, turn on the equipment. Let's go back a little bit about, again, how many people were on the ship the Eldridge when this actually happened on the 12th. The test August. crew was again right around 30, it's about 35 total. Okay, and the names of the people that you recall, certainly Duncan is one of them. Oh yes, Duncan was one of them. Any others? Myself. Right. Uh, Brother Jim, who was not part of the first test because they drew straws, so to speak, uh, as to who was going to be first on the list for the first test, and then they drew uh, the leftovers, so to speak, we used on the second test. Since Jim didn't draw the straw, our younger brother, for the first test, he was on the second one. And anyone who was not used on the first test was used on the second test. Uh, of course, this guy I knew by the name of Wild Bill, as we nicknamed him, Wild Bill Cody, was part of the second test. And there are some other people whose names I cannot remember at this point. Because it's hard to remember the names of those people from that far back, particularly when you're going through more than one set of brainwashing techniques. But the specific ones that I've mentioned had a very good reason to remember them. Do you remember their faces, though? The faces? Yeah. Yes, some of them I do. Right. Because the picture of the graduating class, as we called it, for the Eldridge, or where my father was ahead of it, some of those faces in there are very familiar to me, even though I do not remember the names. Not all of them. Uh, I would say about half are quite familiar. It's interesting because... A lot of the technical details, you have almost, uh, I mean, uh, a photographic memory about those. Mm -hmm. But some of the other details, such as uh, the, the name of the captain or things like that, be become much more difficult to you. The captain was, of course, a temporarily assigned captain. Right. And I ran across that name once, but I do not recall it at this time. And some of the other personnel, in fact, all of the personnel for these tests were temporarily assigned for the specific purpose of those tests only. They were not regular crew members, they were not part of a regular crew, and uh, the regular crew that would be assigned later on was not the people that were involved with these tests. Okay.
So about what time did this uh, test occur? Started right around uh, 1000 hours as they would call it, 10 a.m. in civilian time, mm -hmm. and we turned on the equipment. How, and how far out did you go? We went down again down river about six miles, very close to where the first test was taken, undertaken uh, next to Tinicum Island. And there's two other ships, Coast Guard Carter and the SS Furioseth were there along with the carrier. And the Furioseth also had an observer on it, which was a man who figured in one of the earlier books, uh, Carlos Migulalenda. His real name was not Carlos Migulalenda, that was a pen name. His real name was Carl Allen, Dr. Carl Allen. He had a PhD in physics and he was an officer in the Navy. And he was assigned to the Furioseth as an observer a little further out but uh, not quite as far out as the carrier was. Now why they wanted him on that ship, I don't know, but that was just part of the procedures they followed. Mm -hmm. They had quite a number of observers, and because of Carl Allen's footnotes on a book many years later, other than for that, probably his name would have been long since forgotten. But he uh, lived on in infamy, or whatever you want to call it, because of a certain book, <coughs> The case for the UFO by Morris K. Jessup with all of the footnotes written in there, but allegedly by all one person, Carlos Miguel Alenda. But this happened in 1955, not 1943. But in 43, he was a naval officer on board the uh, uh, Furious Seth. And as the test proceeded, and the modify, modifying requirements by the Navy that they only wanted radar invisibility, not complete optical invisibility, relaxed the requirements slightly. But the reason they stated that they only wanted radar invisibility was because at night in a storm they would not be able to see adjacent ships in a convoy because at that time we didn't have the long-range navigation we have now, we didn't have satellites, we didn't have all of the modern systems which you can pinpoint where a ship or car or whatever is as long as you have the transmitter on board. Uh, so the thought was we've got to be able to see them at night even if it's through a fog and some kind of a signaling device so we can tell where the other ships are. This would not change in any respect the fact that the ships would be radar invisible because radar is a different function than let's say a light system or a light, a light relay or a, uh, a light communication system. So the equipment was turned on, everything seemed to be working insofar as the observers on the three ships were concerned for about 70 seconds. You could see the ship through a greenish haze, which you could not see it on radar. It's totally blank, which is what they wanted. Then there was a blinding flash of light of some kind, and the ship disappeared. The water line disappeared, and it was just plain bay water. No hole, if you will, where the ship should be. Like the last experiment had. Like the first one had. Uh, yeah, right. And <clears throat> with that, of course, there was panic on the carrier. And they tried to raise it by radio. They could not. You couldn't get any radio communications, whatever. And I'm sure that some hair was pulled out. That may have been where some of John von Neumann's hair disappeared. <laughs> and about four hours later, the ship returns to the same spot from which it had departed, with noting from the decks of the carrier and the binoculars that there were some strange changes. Part of the very high antenna system, which was on top of the main antenna mast, or establishing the rotating EM electro, the electric field, which was part of the EM field, was missing. There was pandemonium on the ship. It looked like there was superficial damage to the ship at certain locations, but they couldn't be sure. So they, they couldn't raise anyone on the radio, of course. So, you so mean, the while boarding it was invisible. While it was invisible, they couldn't. And they, they couldn't raise anyone after it was back. Oh, really? And that's right. when they said, we've got to send a boarding party out. Okay. So they sent the boarding party. It boarded the ship, and with two-way radios, I believe four in the boarding party. They boarded the ship, and they wandered around, and the first thing they see is two sailors buried in a steel deck, the bodies intermingled with the steel of the deck, dying or dead. And uh, they find two more upright in a bulkhead, further forward from where they uh, had boarded. Uh, they were essentially dead. The fifth man was still quite alive. He had his hand buried in a bulkhead. So the medical officers, I think 